Hey guys, I'm Alan and welcome to the very first episode of our In Focus series by the Styrene Air Force. The first of many, I hope, uh, where we'll be looking at various techniques and how they're applied and other various aspects of the scale modeling hobby. Um, today I have on my Canada Forces hat. Uh, you can just call me uh, crew chief for this adventure. Uh, I won't mind. Uh, first things first. Um, the stuff that we're going to be discussing in these videos, um, I just want to make everybody know this is just the way I do things. Um, a lot of these techniques um, are pretty general and a lot of people do them differently. Uh, these, what I'm going to demonstrate is the way they've worked for me. Uh, so I'm not necessarily saying what I'm doing here or showing is the exact right way. Uh, second thing I want to bring up, um, if you do like this video, please subscribe at the end and click that notification bell so that you can be notified of um, any future episodes. Also, you can go and like us on Facebook or follow us on Facebook at the Styrene Air Force. Okay, so if that's all done, let's get on with it. Okay, so chipping. Uh, what exactly is chipping? Um, I know I don't need to explain to a lot of you what chipping is. Uh, but just give you a quick basic definition of it. Chipping is an effect where a top layer of paint has been removed by some means exposing a lower or a bottom color. Um, in the scale modeling world, it doesn't matter if it's flaking, peeling, chipping, stripped off, uh, falling off, whatever. We just tend to just refer to it all as chipping. So as far as we're concerned, everything's chipping. Um, regardless of the methodology behind doing chipping, um, there's bas they basically fall into three categories. Uh, the first category is going to be an additive method. The second category will be subtractive. And our third and final category will be masking. Now let's look at these three categories a little bit closer as to exactly what's involved. Okay, so for additive, this is when the chipping color is applied or added over the base color to produce the chipping effect. Subtractive is when the top color is removed or subtracted to reveal a chipping color underneath the top layer. And masking is where the chipping effect is created by using a mask between the chipping color and the main color and then removing the mask reveals the effects. So whether you're trying to get the effect of peeled paint, worn paint, chipped paint, or scratches, or even as far as to go with rusty paint, you are going to employ at least one or multiples of these three different categories. Oh. I'm going to be demonstrating all three of these categories and just to go that little extra just to make this an extra value video I am going to attempt to do at least three different techniques for each category um, so you know three types of additive three types of subtracting and three types of masking so we're going to demonstrate all of that for most of this uh, demonstration I'm going to be using pretty much some very high contrasting colors so we're going to be seeing a lot of black a lot of silver and probably a lot of white um, most cases maybe just a black and silver but um, that is just so that you can see the full effect of what's happening and what to expect so that being said we're going to dive into the first category okay so the first category we're looking at is in the additive and we're going to look at applying paint chips by paintbrush. Uh, so what I've got here is I've got an old Spitfire here that I just painted up with some uh, black primer just to give you your background and we're going to add those paint chips with um, Vallejo's bottle here steel. So the best way to get this going is we'll get a little drop. I just got a little water bottle top here and we'll just get a couple drops in there. Now a lot of people do recommend uh, thinning down this water a little bit. Um, we, most people like to use something like a paint retarder or flow improver to keep it from drying too fast. thing I can use here right now just for this demonstration is we'll just use a little water. 
gonna get a really thin paintbrush, very fine tipped. This is not one of my best ones. In fact, I don't really have a best one because I don't particularly like using a brush to do paint checks. So I'm gonna get that going. And then all we're just gonna do is make sure you have your references nearby and of what you want to replicate. So you're just basically going to just pull off the tip there. And then you're just going to start adding a little bit of silver paint here. But you also want to make sure that your brush is kind of dry. You don't want to have it too much in there. And then you're just going to keep adding little paint chips like this. Going in and adding on all of that on there. Just getting an idea of where you want your chips to go. So we're just going to look at that. And we're just going to do this. Now for me, like I said, I don't really like using a brush, but I'm going to use this here right now just to lay out some of the basic chipping technique. And then what you do is you get all of that. We're just going to do something that's going to look like angled chipping, like that. And then we're going to get all of that into there, like that. So that's basically how you're going to look at it. Uh, it's just basic, simple, and you've got a lot of control over this because, you know, you can only put the chips right where you want them. Uh, if I had a smaller brush or a finer brush, I could certainly do a little bit better with it. But we're just getting the basic foundation there for what's going to go. Now for me, what I like to do, and we're still going to put this under the uh, category of using a brush, is I like to use a toothpick because it's got a really fine tip and everything. You can use the same mixture in it. Just dip the tip in and then you can add some really fine stuff after that. Yes, it takes a lot longer, but you can do a lot more with it. You know, you can feather it all out a little bit more. You can make your chips bigger, lighter, smaller. You know, you can just do stuff like that. And just keep, you know, working in and around some of these bigger things like this. And then you just start adding all of this crap in like that. And you just build on it if you want. You know, you can add some extra stuff here. You know, you can get it, you can add, you know, scratch lines if you want. You know, add all lines, you can add more scratches in. Stuff like that. And you can just build on this. You know, slowly, piece by piece. You know. And then you can just add in like that. Keep adding and just keep adding to where you know you get to the point that you actually like what you have you, know, you can just get it in there go up the side of the thing you, know, you can add some more shapes in here you know you can add all of that just keep touching in following along the top here you, know, you can go in all of the edge of the wing root here start adding some stuff in there and just keep building it all you know if you see stuff where you think you might have added too much no big deal you can just go back in and you know get some of the black and then just start filling back in some of the areas of the black you know just keep going so you just keep adding and keep touching in Now, clearly, I'm not one of the best people at this. There are guys out there, you know, much better at this than I am. Um, you know, you can also go in, you can add the chipping, you know, to look like rivets. You can just add those in like this. You know, just come across little dots the whole you want it. You, know, you can add little dots going across, you know, going down the root of the plane. Just put in little dots, you know, get a little idea of 
uh, rivet work. Yeah, even when there's no rivets there, so you can actually do that and get something that looks like you know you got rivets in the surface. Just pretty much keep going till you've got it to the point you know that you're happy with, and that's it. So that's pretty much one of the ways you can do it. So just so that you can get an idea, that is your chipping by paintbrush. Uh, one of the techniques that you can use to do chipping on any model. Another way of uh, doing the painting on chips is to do something called two-stage chipping. Uh, I'm sure if you ask different people what this thing is called and they may all give you um, completely different answers. Um, so this is going to be basically painting on the chips but also adding a secondary color uh, as if the paint chip was fresh and then going down through to the primer coat or down to the metal. Um, this is primarily used mostly by armor builders and vehicle builders and some sci-fi uh, builders. It's not something that is necessarily associated too often with uh, aircraft building, but it is possible to use it. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and take a quick look at that. I'm just going to do this real quick because I just want to get through all these different techniques as fast as possible and not end up with a three hour video. So right here we've got a base color of Mission Models Green and then we're going to add some a lighter color as if it were a fresher chip um, using Tamiya's Gray Green. So the basic premise behind it is, is that you're just going to paint on a lighter color of your base coat. This is something you see a lot of people use, mostly along edges and that sort of stuff going in. And again, you would probably thin down your paint. Like I said, I'm not really doing that. This is just to demonstrate the process. This is not an actual project or anything that I'm trying to do. So I just want to do the basics of this. This is just another thing you could do. You could actually just do this all by itself to uh, with just this to have the lighter color just to show fresh scratches like you know that hasn't gone all the way through. Um, I'm sure if you've seen little scratches on the sides of your car or on the paint of your vehicle um, where it just scrapes the clear coat you'll see that it kind of has this lighter color almost white in most cases. That's the part we're trying to replicate here. So we got it going like that and then you can get it you know done out in an area like here kind of a thing like that and even if you wanted to you could you know get a little bit of a scratch like that so this is kind of the effect that you're going for the second stage of doing this two stage is to add what would be the second color. Um, in this case usually the second color is either an extremely darkened version of the green or whatever color you've used as your base or a black or a dark gray or a very dark metallic color. Um, in the case of armor builders where it's showing that it's going all the way through to the steel base and it's either oxidized or you know it's got dirt accumulation in it. But the point being is the second color is usually extremely dark or much darker than the first two colors. And what you're going to do with that is you're going to apply this darker color inside the border of the lighter color that you used. And what you're going to end up with is an almost three-dimensional type effect. just want to stay within the center almost you can go up to an edge you know if you want to have a slightly different shape to the darker side and if you even want to 
just add in you know, just a little darker scrape of the darker color by itself off to the side here you know just to get that like that one was just a complete scrape and you don't have to do it to every single one I mean you can mix it up and you know you can have some spots there like you know just want to show where it just periodically in just in little random spots where it goes all the way through and then you know you can get to the little scrape and you can just do that so that's basically the type of effect that you're after you know, let's get it a little closer to the camera so you can see that and this is just another you know dimension that you can go with painting on the chips with a brush now with this uh, technique of applying chips um, of course it does come with certain advantages and disadvantages um, the first advantage is, is that it's very easy to control uh, because you can only put chips exactly where you want it um, it's you have full control over where it's applied the shape it's applied how it's applied put down basically a clear coat before adding the uh, paint chips um, once it's basically dry to touch you can you know clean off excess you can just scrape it off a little bit and uh, fine-tune the shape and the size of the uh, chip that you're getting on there uh, one of the third advantages is is that it can be done very convincingly it can look very realistic if done correctly um, which also is part of the disadvantage of it um, it is a very hard thing to master um, it's got a pretty steep learning curve and if it isn't done correctly it can look like it's just you know painted on which is not the effect that you want to do um, it's harder to make it random because you know there's a tendency when doing it to adopt a certain pattern when putting them on and um, you know randomness is what you want for uh, chipping another well-known method of applying uh, paint chipping using paints is the sponging method now this is one that's been around for a while and a lot of people know this um, and it's where you're just using little small sections of sponge to uh, apply the chipping to the model um, it's always good to have a large variety of different sponges as every different sponge uh, will leave a different uh, different texture uh, so you can get different types of chipping different shapes different sizing uh, and so on and so forth also you know the types that's got the little scouring section those are also pretty good uh, to use as well that'll also add some more variety to the type of chipping um, the favorite one is the packaging foam kind uh, it seems to be the one that a lot of people prefer using and it seems to give quite satisfactory results um, again this is another method like you see a lot of uh, armor modelers using but it's also very common with uh, aircraft it's great for doing edges and leading edges and that sort of stuff on wings and so on and so forth so we're just going to get right into it and we're going to look at that so the idea is to get a small piece of sponge you know into tweezers some people will use pliers some people will just you know use their hands and dab it on um, whatever the method is that you use any one of them are acceptable me personally i prefer these types of uh tweezers so the locking type so it'll actually clamp it in and hold it in there or in the case of here these uh, self-closing tweezers and these can be a bit found on pretty much any one of these uh, you know Amazon AliExpress whatnot what have you but you can find these pretty much anywhere so basically thing is we're going to be using some uh, silver paint here this is a uh, model master enamel chrome silver um, you can pretty much use any paint for this but I do find using uh, enamels and oils to be better because the paint workability tends to be a little bit longer i find the acrylic ones dry too fast and you got to be changing your foam every five seconds anyways let's get on with it so first thing you want to do is get your sponge your uh bit of foam in there sponge and you're going to just dip it in your paint 
and it's going to appear on the end here. What you want to do is kind of unload a lot of this. So get a little piece of paper, you know, and just start unloading it till you get to the area that you want. So once you've got it all pretty much unloaded, you're just going to start dabbing it on the model. You know, where you want to get the chips, how you want to get them. You know, you can get them into little corners and on edges like that. And just keep building into the areas that you want. And you notice some of the flat areas, but it doesn't lend itself to some of these flat areas, these large open areas too well. It's great doing along edges. And it's also great to uh, rotate it and change it because what you end up with here is a situation where you get an effect that is almost like stamping. So if you keep using it in one pattern, then it starts to look like the same thing every single time. It's also a good idea, which is why I said get a variety of sponges, to switch up the sponges in, in between it and um, you know get different textures as well. The other thing is why you want to unload it too, you know, is you don't want to end up coming in and putting on the, the foam and trying to put on your chip and then you wind up with that. I mean, even that's not too bad. But if you go on with it too much and you press on it too hard, you end up with that. You don't want to get that. So you just want to make sure that it's fairly unloaded and just very lightly, almost just barely touching the surface. And then you can get that. And that essentially is the basics of using foam or sponge for chipping. Um, again, as with the other type of chipping, there are some uh, advantages and disadvantages to using sponge chipping. Uh, one of the major advantages are uh, it's very easy to do. It's probably one of the simplest forms of chipping that almost anybody between beginner to expert level can do. Uh, it tends to give you a much more random type of uh, chipping um, because it's just going to end up wherever the piece of sponge makes contact with the surface. Um, I find that you can achieve much smaller chips with this than doing the uh, applying it with a brush, um, and it gives you much more, much smaller type chipping. And the great, the next thing about it is that you can get more chips in less time in a larger area. Um, some of the negatives or the disadvantages of it is that it can become very pattern repeating, uh, which is why I suggest rotating your foam every now and then, or using different uh, different types of sponges to randomize the patterns. Um, it's not very good also to use on very large and open flat areas. Um, I wouldn't recommend using it too much for that. It is possible to do it, but it's not the very best thing for that type of a thing. Okay, one of the final methods um, in the additive category is applying chipping using colored pencils. Um, so for that, we're gonna be using uh, this Prismacolor Silver and I'm going to use this 5D graphite pencil. Um, things to note about this, uh, it's best if they're applied over a flat surface because uh, you need something for the, the uh, pencil lead to grab onto. Um, putting it on a gloss surface is not ideal. Uh, it just slides just all over the place. It doesn't actually mark the surface. And uh, satin, satin coats will probably work as well but not quite as good as uh, matte coats. Um, you can pretty much use any set of colored crayons to do this or colored pencils, um, but I do find the Prismacolor brand to be much better for it. Um, also because the Prismacolors, they tend to have more of, the, of an oil-based core versus a lot of the other standard uh, school use crayon uh, colored pencils that have more of a wax based core um, so that being said these can actually go on and be blended almost you know with uh, mineral spirits like an oil paint but that is something we will look at later um, you can pretty much use any 
graphite pencil for chipping as well. Um, anything from a 2B onwards would be best. Um, they go all the way up to 12B. Uh, you might be able to get those in uh, specialty art stores in some, um, in some places. Um, right now we're just going to use 5B. This is also great for using darker metallic type chips. So, what we're going to basically do here with it is, again, make sure you have your references because that's always crucial. And then we're just going to basically just draw the chips on. So you're just going to, you know, this is a practice that has been long forgotten with a lot of people because of so many different uh, modeling based products that are out there. So this is kind of almost like a bit of a lost art. But it is a technique that's out there that's available. So basically the idea is just to start with a bunch of little dots. And you can make them as small or as many as you want and, and just keep kind of tapping and overlapping with them till you get what you want. Or you can actually just draw in a shape that you want and just color it in. And then you can come in, add some of the other chipping in and around it. You know, you can do little squigglies or little scrapes. You know, but this is the sort of thing that you can also achieve as far as chipping goes. You see a little bit of it right there in the wing root there. Um, if you want, now you can get out and expand it a little bit more. Just turn it at an angle that you can actually see. You know, you can start graduating out into the wing. So it's basically like painting the chips on. You're just using a pencil instead. You, know, you can do little things, go scrapes going off. You know, you can get a scratch there and it's build off of it there. Follow along this line. Carry it on like that. Same thing here. You know, you can follow along some of these rivet lines here if you want. I know it's not exactly cooperating with me. And you know, you could just build it up to where you want it. And also, you know, like the uh, doing it with a paintbrush, it does take a little bit of time to master and practice um, and stuff. But the most common color to use for something like this is silver. Um, but in reality, you can use pretty much any color. You can go back to where we were doing a two-stage chipping where you're painting it on, where you can actually use a lighter color of the base color. So... If you're going to invest in these, uh, they do come in sets uh, of 12, 24, 36, 48, 72. Um, but I wouldn't waste the money buying the sets because there's a lot of colors in the sets that are um, that are basically irrelevant to, to the hobby. Um, they do sell them as individuals, so I would suggest getting them in the individuals and get you know the silver, white, black, that sort of stuff. And then when you get to some of the other colors like grays and greens and browns, you pretty much just want something that's in a light, medium, dark. Because that's pretty much the only place that you're going to stay in with it. Um, other colors that I would probably suggest would be something maybe in a darker red for red chipping and, you know, maybe a greenish yellow for aircraft chipping. Um, now, you can do it with a silver like that or if you've got lighter surfaces, that's where you can come in with the uh, graphite pencil. Pretty much the same approach. So right now I'm just going to focus here on just this wing root here, just so you can see. And it's just basically the same thing, just dots and dashes and little squigglies and you know you can color in a whole area if you want. Just like that, you know, around that rivet kind of a thing.
just build it up slowly. Now again, you know, I'm not focusing on too much detail here. I'm just giving you an idea of, you know, how you can use the materials. So you can get all the way over here. And you can get a couple of chips there, right there as well. Now you can go around this fuel probe here. You can get some other chipping type effects around it. You know, and that's the sort of stuff that you can do with. As with all the other techniques that we've discussed so far, uh, using colored pencils also has its advantages and its disadvantages. Uh, many of its advantages are going to be similar to painting on the chipping. So you've got total control over what you're doing, so you can decide where they go, how they go, what shape they are, how intense they're going to be, uh, how big an area you're going to cover with it. Uh, because they're also colored pencils and pencils, uh, you can correct any mistake. Uh, if you have something that you don't like, uh, it's just as simple as much as pulling an eraser and just basically rubbing them off. Uh, it's very easy to do. Basically, uh, drawing on paper, you're just drawing on your model. Um, when it's done correctly, it can look very convincing, which also, like doing the paint chipping with paintbrushes, is also its Achilles heel. Um, it is hard to master. It does take some practice, and if it isn't applied properly, it can look pretty fake. So, that being said, that is pretty much the end of the additive methods of uh, doing chipping. So we're going to move on to our next category, which is going to be subtractive. Our first technique in the second category involves the use of chipping fluids, also known as a hairspray method. This process was created a while ago by Philip Stasinskis, and popularized by Mike Rinaldi in recent years. This process is a crucial one as it is most likely the most used technique in the hobby today and has been used for all sort of chip paint effects. This technique has become so popular over the years that model paint companies have made products specifically to reproduce this technique more consistently. Companies such as AK Interactive, MIG, Vallejo, and a quick Google search has found a few others. This technique involves putting down a chipping color, then a layer of hairspray, then the final color. Applying water will cause a hairspray to dissolve, causing the top layer to come off in small chip-like particles, revealing the underlying color. It is recommended to use a medium to firm hole hairspray designated by a 3 or 4 on the can, and it can either be from an aerosol or of the pump kind, which I personally prefer. The aerosol kind can be sprayed directly from the can in two very light coats or decanted into an airbrush for use. Or you can use any one of the made for bottling products. AK or MIGS would be my preferred suggestion. Now let's take a look at this process in action. Okay, for the first part of this, so we've got this sprayed down with uh, some Vallejo aluminum color. And then just because of how delicate uh, my fine Vallejo, I just gave out a light coat of uh, future on this. So this would be our chipping color. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to come in and then we're going to apply the hairspray. Now the hairspray that I use, for those that are curious, is this uh, Herbal Essence uh, number 2 medium. Um, I got it because it was the one that had the least amount of scent to it. Uh, again, I prefer the uh, pump type. So that you know, it's much easier to just pour it straight out of the bottle and not have to worry about decanting it. So, moving on, we're going to apply a layer of this hairspray over this section here. So we're going to come in with one light layer first. We're going to let that dry for a bit. Just going to blow some air on it. Coming with a slightly heavier coat after this. And 
Uh, depending on the size chips you want, that would be depending on how much spray you put down. If you want it to be bigger chips, you're going to apply more. If you want less chipping, more of a worn type patterning, you're going to put down less hairspray. So we're just going to let that sit and dry for a bit, and then we'll apply the top color. Okay, once that's dried for a bit, then we're going to apply our uh, top color on it. For Like I said earlier in the video, we're going to be using a uh, very high contrasting color so that at least the effect will show up. So now we're going to apply some Vallejo black, flat black. And then we're going to let that set for a bit. And we begin to apply the water. I mean, you can see where the paint starts to chip off as the hairspray underneath starts to dissolve. And you don't want to flood it too much. Because then you just start seeing pieces just start falling off. And this is probably doing that right now because it put way too much hairspray on. It's okay if it's a little extreme right now because I just want you to be able to see the effect as it's happening. Got a little bit of a hair there. What you can also do is you can introduce something like a toothpick into this to um, as soon as I can find one, you can bring a toothpick into it and you can start to get you know even smaller chips. You can also get you know little scrapes. Um, of course, this is coming off in sheets right now. So let's get up over to here a little bit. You know, you can get little scrapes and even little dots there. If you even wanted to, on an aircraft, you could come in and you know. Get rivets. That kind of thing. But all in all, you can do it. You can try to get as many chips as you want. But like I said, you want to use a little less water. Follow along 
other side a piece like this. This is one of the reasons why I used the Vallejo because I knew it was going to cause some very extreme chipping, but I just wanted you to be able to see the effect, you know, in full blow. You know, and once you get to where you want it to be, then you can just pretty much stop and let the surface dry off. So what you got there is the results of the hairspray chipping. Now this can be more or less if you want. Uh, there are a few factors that affect uh, how this effect works. And we're going to sit down here quickly and just discuss that. So with this technique, uh, there are three basic points uh, pointed out by Mike Rinaldi, who is you know, one of the big proprietors of this uh, technique. Um, this first basic point to consider is hairspray quantity. Um, it's good to note that the amount of chipping, the size of chipping, and how fast it starts to chip is going to be dependent on the amount of hairspray you actually put down for this. Um, if you put down more hairspray, you put down more coats, it's going to chip a lot faster, you're going to get a lot bigger chips. Um, if you put down less hairspray, then it's going to be a little harder to chip. You're going to get more of a, a lot more fine chips and more of a wearing type uh, effect going on. Uh, the second basic point is the opacity of the top layer of the paint. Um, this is where we put the top coat on, uh, depending on how thick you put that on. Uh, obviously, it speaks for itself to say that the thicker the top coat or the more coats you put on is the harder it's going to be chipped to for it to chip because it's got a little bit more surface thickness for the water to penetrate to go back down into reactivating the hairspray. So that's something very, uh, very much to consider. Also, the third basic point is drying time of the hairspray or the paint. Um, obviously, if you leave it on for longer periods, it's going to cure harder and it's going to uh, react a little bit harder um, to, to get to the chipping. Um, I think this is probably more so for some of the uh, modeling products that are out there, um, as in like the AK heavy chipping or their uh, worn effects or MIGs. Uh, heavy chipping or their chips and scratches. Uh, so that might be something to also think about. Further to Mike Rinaldi's uh, suggestions of his three basic points, uh, there's some other factors that um, I think uh, bear some mention um, as to you know what's going to affect this uh, process. Um, the first of these other factors is going to be the bottom coat. Uh, so your chipping coat, whether it be silver or another color or primer or whatever, um, it's going to be dependent on whether that coat is gloss or a matte coat. Um, you now with some of these modeling, made for modeling products, they recommend putting it on a semi-gloss or a satin coat uh, because they are different. They react differently. One is to, is going to be you know more responsive to water the other is going to be less responsive to water but that will also change depending on whether or not you put the hairspray over a gloss coat or a matte coat um, over a gloss coat is going to chip much more readily regardless of the product that you use versus over a matte coat um, the second and other factor is going to be what we would consider let's just say the wholeness level of the hairspray or the chipping fluid um, Again, there are two types of chipping fluid. Uh, there is a heavy chipping, which is required for you know larger chips or very extreme chipping, and then a uh, smaller scratches and worn effects, which is going to provide uh, much smaller chipping and much smaller scratches. Um, so these two products are going to react differently at different rates uh, with the water to produce different types of chipping. Uh, it's going to be the same with a hairspray, uh, depending on whether you go with you know. A mild hold, a firm hold, or an extra firm hold, you know, the one, two, three, four, five, whatever rating is, it is going to behave differently depending on which one of those that you use. So that's another thing to bear in mind. 
Um, a third factor to keep in mind is the top coat. Again, that is also going to be determined uh, whether it's a gloss or a matte coat. Uh, this is because a gloss coat is going to be much denser than a matte coat and the water penetration is going to be a lot more difficult on a gloss coat versus a matte coat. A matte coat is going to have a lot, it's going to be a little bit more porous. The water is going to penetrate it to get to the hairspray coat a lot easier. So you got to remember it is going to behave differently with a matte coat or a gloss coat over it. The last factor to consider is the paint type. Uh, this being whether you're using acrylic paint, lacquer paints, or enamel paints. It's important to note that a lot of the demonstrations that you see um, all over the internet, all over YouTube, uh, even with what I just did here, 90% of those demonstrations are all going to be acrylic. Uh, only because acrylic is probably more responsive to this technique than any other paint type. Um, but that is not to say you can't use any of the other paint types. It'll work with lacquers, it'll work with enamels, it just may take a little bit longer for the effect to start. But um, there are videos out there of Mig Jimenez uh, showing using some of the enamel weathering products within this process. That is something we will also look at in later videos. So it'll work for all three types, just it's going to react differently uh, depending on which type you use. Okay, so let's look at some of the... Uh, advantages and disadvantages of the uh, chipping fluid process. Uh, first, the advantages. So this technique probably reproduces some of the uh, most realistic chipping effects that you could possibly achieve. Uh, this is mostly because we're actually chipping the paint. So it's uh, not only does it look good, uh, it's actually three-dimensional because there is some depth to it. Uh, second thing about it is, is that it is both random and you have control over it. Uh, so it is going to chip off randomly where you put the water and where it just basically lets go. Or, you know, using specific tools like I demonstrated using a toothpick, you can probably affect certain uh, chips into specific areas and control how that goes. Um, it's very simple to do. And there's no special product that um, is required for it um, unless you're planning to get any of the uh, made for modeling chipping fluids by AK or MIG. The disadvantages of it is that it's got a pretty high learning curve um, because you have to start to try to figure out, you know, based on all of the basics and the, you know, other factors that were discussed earlier as to how much paint you're putting down, what kind of paint you're using, how much air spray to use, what, you know, gauge you're using, whether you're using the heavy chipping or just the worn effects uh, fluids. It can be a bit inconsistent at times, again, due to the learning curve, mostly because of you're trying to figure out, get a good feel for it. And it can be a little hard to control because um, sometimes, it's, you know, instead of getting small chips where you want them, you'll get these big, massive chunks falling off. Uh, the third main advantage of disadvantage, sorry, of the chipping process is that it tends to leave the hot top coat a bit prone to tape lift. Um, so, you know, as you go into your build and into your painting, uh, you may find that there are some areas that you have the hairspray under that, you know, masking tape may lift up. So you might want to, you know, do some forethought and do some um, detacking. Uh, one thing I did not mention in the actual demonstration with the hairspray chipping method is that once you get to where you, where you want it and you leave it to dry, to prevent any further chipping from happening, you're going to need to seal it into a clear coat. So just bear that in mind. Okay, our next subtractive method that we're going to do is, it's not really an actual process per se. It was something I experimented with a little while back um, on a, an old Raiden Jack uh, weathering. And it was done pretty much by a process I'm just going to call a uh, tape pull. Uh, so what it is, is I put down an enamel based on this and what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of the different adhesion properties between an enamel paint and an acrylic. No, you can only do this with an acrylic on top of an enamel. So what we're going to do is 
We've got this enamel on. Uh, this right now is going to be Model Masters um, Chrome Silver Enamel. And then I'm just going to come over this with a dark... Uh, what's this? Uh, Vallejo Dark Sea Grey. Just to get some um, contrasting color. So we're just going to apply a, la a layer of this down. It really doesn't matter which acrylic you use, as long as it's an acrylic. See, the bottom color is an enamel. So we've got that right there, and we're just going to let that dry for a bit. Okay, so once your acrylic layer has dried, uh, like I said, we're going to take advantage of the incompatibility of the two paints, let's say that. So, now you're just going to get a piece of masking tape out, and you can either ball it up or roll it up, you know, just get small amounts, but what I'm going to do is this. So what we're going to do is, we're going to press it down on the area firmly, and then we're just going to pop it up. And this is the kind of thing that you're going to get. You know, you can go in with smaller bits, you know. That sort of stuff. I mean, you're just going to get the surface to just chip up. Now, this is going to give you a lot of extreme chipping, and it's going to depend on the adhesive nature of the piece of tape. But you're going to get this type of an effect as well. It is a useful effect, you know, if you're doing a single color scheme and you just want to have some random chipping and everything. Uh, you could do this if you want. It's a quick, fast, easy way to do it. Um, no, there really isn't a whole lot of advantage to it, other than you know, if you're using it only over a single color camo, that's great. But the biggest disadvantage with this clearly is going to be, uh, it's going to be a pain in the ass doing any masking from here on in. Um, so you might want to keep that uh, in the back of your mind if you decide to choose this. Like I said, I've only ever used this process twice, once to test it, once on a build. I've never really used it again since. Uh, like I said, the shortcomings on it is a little too much for me to really call this an effective method. But I just thought it was something that would be nice to show you guys that there are, you know, several different ways you can approach this. And, you know, you can just experiment with it. The next process that I'm going to demonstrate is probably uh, one of my least favorite to do. Um, it has the potential to have the most disastrous results. Um, it is going to be involved with using a knife or a sharp object to actually create the chips and stuff in the uh, top coat. Um, this I would probably say would be more along the lines of using for like scratches and very small chips. Um, so what I've got here is I've got a silver color down. Uh, it's not the greatest color in the world. As you can see, the metal flake in it is kind of big. And I've also applied a couple coats of a clear coat over it. Uh, considering the method that we're going to be using to do this, I would strongly suggest putting down that extra clear coat because what you do get there is an extra uh, barrier uh, or an extra layer that you that'll give you a little bit of uh, protection, so to speak, uh, that you can go into with the knife or with the sharp object and not worry too much about creating too much damage into your actual uh, color coat. So this is something I would uh, strongly recommend doing before going ahead with this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load up my airbrush right now with the top coat that we're gonna be doing the chipping onto, and then we'll get right back to that. Okay, so again, I'm gonna use another dark color. It's gonna be uh, Model Air RAL, R-A-L 7016 Blue Gray. Um, for some reason, my black isn't cooperating. But again, I'm using a lot of Vallejo colors only because of the delicate nature of them and they're actually easy to work with doing this because they're not very durable let's just go there so that, has, that actually works in the favor of doing this so let's just get this color down and then we'll get to it
Okay, so I got this finished up off uh, camera here. Um, it's having a little bit of some clogging issues with my airbrush. Uh, probably because I haven't cleaned it since I started doing this video. Um, but anyways, so here we are. So what we've got now is we've got the color coat done. Um, it has been dried. I just forced dried it with a bit of an air, uh, hair dryer. And now we're going to start getting the chipping effect in. So what I'm going to use right now is I'm just going to use my X-Acto knife with a fairly decent blade in it. doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, I've got a toothpick and I've also got one of these plastic type toothpicks that I uh, picked up at the dollar store I wanted to experiment with so this will be the first time I'm going to be using these. Um, you can also if you like use you know your awl or your uh, scribing tool. This might be a little bit sharp but let's have it here to see what's going on because after all this is only just a demonstration. So what you want to do is you want to get into it and you want to be very, very, very delicate with it because you don't want to scrape in too far. So I was, like I said, I would suggest this to be more of a technique to use to do scratches. So you just want to basically come in and just slightly tap at it with a razor red knife blade. You just want to get the top part of it removed and again like I said because of the Vallejo it chips really nice and then you've got the clear coat underneath there actually helping to uh, preserve that metal coat underneath there See, you can get some really fine chips in it doing this. And you, like I said, if you want, you can come in. So we're going to experiment with a little uh, scribing tool here. And again, this is also giving a nice effect because it's actually chips and scratches. Now we're going to go on with the, tooth, the toothpick. Uh, again, like I said, you can pretty much use anything that's got a pretty decent tip on it. You know, you can come in, you can scrape off as much as you want. You can get, you know, these chips in. Come in, just... Clean up a whole area here if you want. And you can come back in with something else like the plastic one here. And just feather this chipping here if you want. You know, just stuff like that. You can come back in with like the knife. You just want to feather this all in a little bit. And that's the sort of stuff that you can get doing it. So let's get it real close up there so you can see it. And um, actually, that didn't come out too badly. So that's just to give you an idea of, you know, another way that you can go using uh, some negative, some negative, subtractive or negative scratching, whatever you want to call it, uh, chipping. But this is pretty much another dimension you can you can go. No, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could go all the way even through the other one into the bottom coat there. And then you could get, you know, something like that and, you know, get your two-layer chipping or your double, your two-type of chipping, which is actually going to be really real. Uh, but I don't know if you can see it, but if you look at it from an angle here, you know, you can actually see that it is, it's got some depth to it. So, that being said... That is doing chipping, you know, with a knife. Uh, just generalized, call it a knife, but it's pretty much using any type of uh, sharp object. So there you go.
this next technique involves using uh, Windex as a bit of a, I guess you could call it a chipping fluid, but it's more using it as a thinner. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there that use Windex as a thinner, and there's a lot of people out there who frown very highly on it. Anyways, the point is, it can be used for what the next demonstration. Um, for this particular purpose, I'm using Windex, uh, mostly because Windex is a recognized brand name. Uh, it is one of the most used ones, probably, uh, as a thinner. But basically, you can use pretty much any glass cleaner that has some amount of an alcohol content. Because what really is the activator here is the alcohol or uh, isopropyl alcohol. So IPA will work fine as well. Um, I would probably suggest not using pure alcohol as it may eat more than you want it to. So right now we've got a layer of silver dome. Uh, it's got a coat of future on it. Again, another product a lot of people frown on. But this is a demonstration. So, hey, maybe what will happen is uh, people will get to see why people frown on it. But anyways, we're going to go. So we've got our little cup of Windex here. I've got a fairly stiff brush here. Uh, it's just a dollar store type brush. It's nothing really special. Uh, so we're just going to go and we're going to add our color in. Again, this is going to be the RAL7016, uh, which I used in the last demonstration, which worked out pretty nicely. So we're going to go in and we're going to add that one more time. So two things about this process. One, this is something you need to do where you're going to do this particular step all in one. Uh, because you don't want to have this acrylic curing too much. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be pretty difficult to remove. And second of all, um, to call this a chipping effect may not be the most accurate. But because, you know, we're talking about chipping as a generalized term... Um, I would probably say this would be more of a faded paint to worn paint uh, type of effect. So, once you've got it pretty much dried to touch, you're going to get the brush. You're going to get it in the Windex here. You want to remove some of the excess. So, you're going to take um, advantage of some of the thinning properties or some of the affecting properties that alcohol, which is in the uh, Windex, how it reacts to an acrylic paint. Which is the other thing about this process. It can only work with an acrylic. Um, as to if it will work with every acrylic, I don't know. I know it certainly will work with Tamiya's. Uh, it'll work with Mission Models. It'll work with Vallejo for sure with Vallejo. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, you're just going to get that thing in. and get some of the excess out. And then you're just going to keep applying it. And you're going to wait for it to start activating. So now what you've got here is some chipping there. So might have gone a little too early on this. You know, and the longer you leave it to dry, the harder it is to remove. So... to get into there scrubbing on it right now we're actually getting a chipping effect which isn't too bad which is kind of what it is so again here you are you're getting this uh chipping effect on it with the paint coming off now as you notice this is just happening quite randomly there's really no rhyme or reason to where it's coming up it's just popping up depending on where it's letting loose So that's basically giving you some chipping. So I'm going to get a hair dryer on this and I'm going to force dry this a little bit to see if I can get it to cure up a little bit better and see if we can get more of the uh, wear, wearing tendencies on um, this thing. Okay, so got it a little drier now, left it for a little bit. I got a slightly softer brush to use on it here. And we're going to take a lot more of the uh, hairspray out. Let's 
see if this is going to work. Yeah, so now you see again this slightly reduced removal. It's not like jumping off the plastic as much. Oh, there we go, it's starting to open up. Now I've used this technique before and it hasn't been this drastic, so I'm guessing the uh, lesson to be learned here is maybe not use Vallejo. Vallejo strips too easily. I know with Tamiya especially, and it's probably the paint I should have used for this demonstration, will give you a much more gradual wearing of the, the, the uh, paint color. But anyways, this is just a demonstration just to give you an idea of yet another way to uh, enact some uh, subtractive chipping. So that's basically what you're going to get and not much else I can say about that other than yeah I'll withdraw my initial uh, statement that Vallejo might be a good one to use. I would probably stick more to the Tamiya's for this. Another good subtractive method of attaining a worn surface or some small chipping is to use sandpaper. So we're going to demonstrate that really quick. Um, again, I've got another piece here. Uh, I've got it coated with some white. And again, you're going to want to put a light clear coat down on this. So we're going to get our darker color on top of this, and then we're going to get to work on that. Okay, so now we've got our dark color down. Again, the RAL um, 7016. And now we're going to just get onto this. So all the, really what I've got here is a bit of wet, dry sandpaper. It's about 400 grade. And it might be a little coarse for what we're going to do, but you're just going to get an idea of the whole process. So we're just going to get on it, and then we're going to just lightly sand away at it. You're going to get this kind of a thing. As you can see, there isn't a whole lot of control on this, but just depending on where you want to put it is what you're going to get here. good thing to do is just sand it in the direction of your airflow. I'll be using it on like wings. And you can get this uh, little worn effect. Now after this you can go over this with the, uh, your choice of clear coat and pretty much you're done. The next and final method in the uh, subtractive category that we're going to look at is we're going to look at reverse chipping. Uh, reverse chipping is pretty much similar to doing the hairspray method, except um, it's going to be done with it where instead of chipping down to the chipping color, you're going to chip the top as the chipping color um, over your base color. So this would be great if you've, um, like say, forgotten to do, you just did a basic paint coat and you wanted to do some chipping on it. Um, your choice would be either to go with one of the additive methods, but if you wanted to do a subtractive method, this is one that you could do. Um, there are a few products all on the market uh, for this type of uh, process. Uh, VMS or Vantage Modeling Solutions, they do make a product uh, specifically for this. and They do recommend you use all of their products in conjunction to um, achieve the best results. But um, I'm sure if you do a proper Google search, there are other companies out there. I um, I personally have my own methods for it and that's what we're going to look at here. Okay, so for the first part of this technique, we're just going to basically follow the same protocols we do when doing a standard hairspray chipping. So we've got our base color down, which is going to be our chipping color. We've got our hairspray over. Now we're just going to go over it with the dark color for contrast and I'm going to use Emission Models Black. And in here we've got our black down and then we're going to go to the next step of this. This is where the idea of the reverse part of this process comes in. So 
the chipping color we want is the chips to be black not the gray that was underneath so what we're going to do is we're gonna, same as before get our water got a little tap water here room temperature warmer doesn't really matter it just has to be plain water and we're just going to get on there and start getting that to start activating now the difference is because you want the chips black you're going to be looking now about removing more of this black than you would normally be doing with a chipping method so you really want to get all the way down into it so you want to get off as much of it as you possibly can or to keep it down to where you want it so we're just going to keep going keep going this now is getting to be more of a wear type thing. Whoops, let's get it in there. So now we've got the water activated on it there. So this is what you want to be trying to do. You want to get the black is your chipping color. Right now we're getting a very worn type effect. This might not have been the best meal to use, but you're getting the idea here. So the idea is, is you're going to remove pretty much all of the top layer. Just down to where you want it. So it may not be the most perfect example, but this is basically what the idea of reverse chipping is going to be. So you'd probably be removing and keeping it hydrated to get as much of the top color off as you possibly can to uh, leave it back into... Uh, some of the chipping so what you can do is you know you got a lot of very excessive smaller chipping going on here and then along here now if they had gotten it a little bit cleaner which is what I was hoping for you know you'd have gotten it right back to the original color like in some spots like here okay so that's one method that one didn't exactly come out as planned but hey it's just a demonstration. So now we're going to get to the other method of doing the reverse chipping, which is the one I prefer doing, and this is the one that I doing that I do, uh, copying the VMS type product. So we'll get onto that next. What we're going to do here is we're going to basically create a chippable color. Um, you can buy chippable colors um, in you know market stores. Uh, there is a product out there that's a chippable paint. Um, it's probably more used for uh, winter camouflage. So it'll be like your washable whites and all of that. And it's basically done uh, in the same fashion as a hairspray. Uh, again, the hairspray method can be used. Just put a hairspray down, spray your white over, basically wash off the white, and then you're going to get to this type of effect. So it'll be back to kind of the first type of... Um, reverse hairspray chipping that we did the second one here though which is what i'm trying to do is to get the product to behave similar to how the vms product goes so what i do is i mix in my cup the 50 50 mix of the paint and the chipping fluid so in theory it's now made the regular acrylic paint into a chippable paint um, this can only be used for an acrylic obviously because the hairspray is water-based and it won't work with lacquers and it won't work with enamels so this can only be used for um, acrylics so we're just going to get into there and then we're just going to get the, the color going on here and for this it's best to have a clear coat down first the 
side, you pretty much want it to lift up cleanly and not embed itself into the paint, which is probably what happened with the previous uh, demonstration I did. I didn't get enough of a clear coat barrier. Okay, so we got that, so now we're going to begin chipping it. Okay, now to start the uh, chipping process. Same as with, with the hairspray, just get the thing wet. And we're going to go in and start hydrating this with water. And what you're going to see here now is the black paint is starting to chip off. And nice big chunks here, which is kind of what you want. Let's change the brush to something with more of a pointy, nice little round tip, which should probably be good for this right about now. And for those of you watching, yes, you can use this process here and make your own washable winter camo paint. This will give you probably some really fine type chipping going on in there and the more you remove is the finer you're going to get your chips of course this process is extremely extremely messy This is probably going to be more useful to armor builders versus aircraft builders. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a tank body to replicate this on. want to remove almost all of the color except where you want to have your chipping so once you're at that point you've got it pretty much done you can just dry up all the excess here you know while it's still a little bit on the wet side you know you can start to clean up some of these other areas here that you didn't want Q-tip here just to get rid of some of the excess because up until this point the paint is still as you can see in a chippable state just keep wetting your Q-tip if you want and just start getting rid of some of the excess like I said this was just a demonstration so for demonstration purposes we're just going to stop right there and then that's pretty much what you've got. So you've got some kind of a chipping type process there. Let's go back to this other one here. You could probably get some of it off still, maybe not. But anyways, so this would be the way that you can also do uh, a reverse chipping. Like I said, this would be great if you're doing like an armor. Uh, if you want to get down to the, you know, the dark metal colors. Or if you just want to do it as a white winter camel. So... That's pretty much one of the other things that you can do. Okay, so now we're moved into our final category um, of masking. And the first part of this that we're going to explore is salt chipping. Um, everybody's probably very familiar with this method to use for chipping. Um, but what a lot of people may not exactly realize is that this is more of a masking process than an actual chipping process. Um, now what you're going to have is, is salt chipping. The salt particles are going to create your mask and you paint over that and then you get the uh, resulted chips. So we're going to take a look at that right now and then we're going to demonstrate that. And um, we're going to go from there. So all you really need for this is basically some salt. 
Um, I've got some kosher salt, some regular salt, some sea salt here all mixed up uh, so that I could get different uh, size particles. Next thing you're just going to need is just some plain water. This is still some water left back from my uh, previous my, uh, reverse chipping process and then we're going to get into that. So, you know, there's several different ways I've heard people say to do this, but this is the way that I learned it and this is the way I'm going to demonstrate it. So we're just going to get the water done. So we're just going to brush, I brush on the water only because you don't really want to flood the surface with it. And then once you've got it to there, you're just going to sprinkle some salt on as exactly how you want it. There's not a lot of control that you're going to have on this. I mean, the salt part chips are just going to fall wherever, you know. And that's pretty much the process there. Um, at this point, if you wanted to, the only part of it that you could probably say is any kind of control is, is that you can manipulate some of these uh, chips into areas that you know how you want them to go so you know you can get the chips however you want it and just move them around that way you can even come in with a toothpick and just you know gently persuade them to go where you want them to go then essentially here now, you're just going to leave that for this to completely dry. It's got to be completely dry before you move on to the next stage. So once the water is completely evaporated, uh, you're going to find that the uh, salt crystals are going to stay pretty much stuck to the surface. So what happens here is, is the salt is partially dissolved on the surface with the water. And then as soon as that dries, it basically serves almost like a glue. So they're kind of stuck to the surface. So next thing you're going to do after this, once it's fully dried, is apply your color. Now you may see some crystals become detached. Don't worry about it. It's just fine. It's just all part of the process. Actually helps with the randomness. So once you've got your coat on, I'll leave your paint coat to dry. Now once your paint is dried, you just can come in. I know toothbrush, toothbrush uh, a stiff paintbrush, doesn't matter, your finger, or however you need to do it. And we're just going to brush it all. Now in some very extreme cases, you may need to run it under some rinse, under some uh, water to get the salt off. Some cases you don't, so. And that is basically what you end up with, with your salt method. Now the only drawback with the salt method is, you'll see it in little areas here, some little dull areas here. It's uh, fogging from the salt. It is a bit of a pain in the ass because, you know, it does look kind of nasty and you'll see it probably more on some of the other surfaces. Uh, but don't worry about it. You're not ruined. You don't have to go back in and start washing it down and scrubbing down. Yes, it'll help to wipe it down with some water. But uh, best way to get rid of the salt fogging is once you put a clear coat over it, that's just gone. So that's salt masking in our last category. Okay, as we pull in near the end, um, our final technique is going to be doing chipping using a liquid mask. Uh, liquid masks have been around for quite some time. Uh, they do come in a great variety of different brands. Uh, you can get all sorts of different types in the uh, art stores. And there are several modeling companies that do make um, a, a line of liquid masks. Uh, they're also known as a frisket. And what you want in one of these is something that when it dries, it dries to a very rubberized type um, texture, which makes it easier to remove. Um, the most popular brand of liquid mask that's out there for, especially made for modeling, is the Mascal by Humbro. Um, it is probably one of the top recognized brands out there. Um, unfortunately for me, I haven't been able to find it anywhere. 
Um, it became a bit hard to find in Canada here in my area, and I resorted to picking up the next best substitute that I could find, which was Dr. P.H. Martin's Liquid Frisket Mask Liquid Level 1. Um, I've been very satisfied with it. Um, it does do as good a job as a mask all. Uh, quite frankly, I think any of them are pretty much um, going to be pretty much in the same category. Um, if there was anything that I would probably recommend you stay away from is Micro Scales Micro Mask. I did try that at one time and the result was it bonded to the surface and it dried almost like um, a melted plastic bag. Uh, the only way I ended up getting to remove it, I had to actually sand it off. Okay, another substitute to use as a liquid mask that I've seen demonstrated in other videos um, and I've also tried it myself and it works pretty well is water soluble PVA glue. Uh, particularly the kind you find in Walmart or at the dollar store, uh, Elmer's White School Glue. It actually dries to the consistency that you want and it can be removed dry because it does dry rubberized almost or it can just be washed off since it's uh, water soluble it'll dissolve um, another take another item i've heard people say they've used is silicone um, yes it does dry to a rubberized consistency that we want but due to a lot of the very harsh chemicals that make that product up i wouldn't recommend it only because there's no way to predict how it's going to react with your paint so let's get right into looking at this technique Okay, so the first part of this is going to be pretty similar to the uh, sponge chipping method. We're just going to get some of this uh, put out into our palette. So once we've got some of that out, we're going to get into it. And then we're going to apply the masking fluid using a sponge very similar to the sponge technique. We're just going to be a little bit more liberal with it. We're just going to dab it on there. Whoops, we don't want it like that. Let's feather that a little bit. And incidentally, as I mentioned earlier, yeah, using the using white glue or PVA glue for it, you're going to basically apply it in the same exact way. And then we're just going to leave this to dry once we've covered the area that we want. And again, kind of like with sponge chipping, there's not a whole lot of control over, you know, where it goes. It's just wherever it makes contact with the surface, so it is going to be pretty random. Now, the unfortunate thing with this particular product, and this is where something like the Mascol or even the Abtalon type comes into play, is once this thing gets dried, it goes clear. So it's kind of hard to see where it is. Um, with the mask all, it still dries to that purplish color that it's got, and um, the Abtalong one and some of the other ones dries to their like like a uh, opaque, a slightly opaque, translucent kind of blue color. Uh, this is just going to go completely clear. Uh, so we're just going to leave this now to set for a bit, and then once that is, once it's dried, uh, then we're going to come in and put the paint coat over that. Okay, so I went ahead and painted this off camera uh, I think I've done enough painting here to bore you guys enough um, so we've got black on there no that's completely dried now we're gonna remove the liquid mask no you can either rub it with your finger and it'll come right off or you can use a little piece of white tack and just basically just rub it right off but you know finger works fine no, it is a little extreme, and I did it a little extreme on purpose, only to get the uh, maximum effect here. And we got all the masking fluid off. So you can see where you've got different degrees of uh, extreme severe chipping here, 
and you know large areas of chipping and then in the middle here you can see small smaller areas of uh, much finer chipping so that is chipping with a masking fluid so there's a couple of points we want to make note of when doing chipping um, you got to do chipping where chipping is going to make sense um, so first things first references are always a must references are going to be your friend um, failing that there's a couple of general things to remember about chipping as to where they're going to occur um, with you know most older piston aircraft what you're going to find is you're going to get chipping mostly along the um, leading edge of the wing. So you're going to see quite a bit of it, you know, there. And the closer in to the fuselage, this is more you're going to see it. This is going to be because from the prop is going to be kicking up stones and gravel and whatnot during takeoff and landings. And it's going to throw it back into the uh, leading edge of the wings. Another place you're going to want to be seeing it is in wing roots here uh, where pilots and work crew and all of that are getting in and out of the aircraft uh, pilots getting in uh, you know air crew chief is helping him get strapped in and all of that you're going to see it along there um, around areas of maintenance hatches so for guns and uh, fuel ports and stuff like that that is where you're going to see it uh, you're going to see it around areas of engine hatches where these things are going to be pried open, open and closed, open and closed quite routinely. Um, you're going to see that. And any other hatches in and around the, you know, fuselage uh, that's got access or serviceable areas, you're going to see chipping around those. Um, along the edge of the cockpit here, you're probably going to see that where the pilot uh, is getting in and out and maybe on the vertical stabilizer as stuff is getting thrown back. Uh, same thing for underneath. Uh, you're going to take a look at figuring out, you know, where is this thing operating? Um, if it's operating off of a, you know, a dirt or a gravel runway or, you know, crushed coral like out in the Pacific, you're going to have a fair amount of uh, chipping along the back of the wings here, you know, in respect to where the wheels are going to be and the same back here in the tail area. Um, well, most of your chipping is probably going to be seen maybe on the bottom and maybe along the middle also with a prop throwing stuff back into it speaking of props next thing you're going to probably be seeing is when it comes to props you're going to see a lot of chipping on what would be the leading edge of the propeller and it is going to become more severe as you get to the tip and it's also going to be more severe on the back side of it versus the front why i'm not a hundred percent sure um, you're also going to see it on the tips of spinners. You're going to see a lot on front ends, the front nose of uh, aircraft such as this, and even you know with jets. And then you might see it around intakes of uh, engines. So you just got to re logically look at it. What's causing the chips? You know, what's the story behind this particular model that I want to tell? And you know, coming into like I said, you know, the jet aircraft. You can do the same thing. So it's going to be along the leading edges. It's going to be on the noses. It's going to be along the intakes of stuff like that. You're going to want to look at things like drop tanks, along the bottom of drop tanks, on the front of drop tanks, or on the refueling areas of the drop tanks, so on and so forth. So you want to think about that. Same with tanks. You want to think about where's crew going to walk, you know, getting up into, into there. You're going to want it around the hatches and access points. You know maintenance areas like around the engine hatches so think logically about where vehicles are going to chip there's also you got to remember that certain uh aircraft vehicles you know tanks armor they're going to be certain characteristics about the way things chip that you're going to see certain chipping patterns on just about every single aircraft of that kind then you can start getting into the creative and sort of, you know, why this one's chip more, that one's chip more. You know, like I said, you're going to think about use, you're going to think about area of operations, and you're going to think about conditions as to where it goes. And there's a lot of physics involved with it, too, because you're not going to see, you know, chipping um, in areas where there's absolutely no way. Uh, something's going to chip it because what's going to cause a chip or a scratch something hitting it or something rubbing on it So you got to really think about that and think about that part logically Okay, so that pretty much brings us to the end of this uh, 
first episode of the In Focus series that we're going to be bringing. Um, so far, throughout this video, we've looked at at least 12 different uh, techniques to achieve chipping or chipping effects on different models. Um, I would encourage everybody to experiment, try as many of them as you can, see one which you know which one works more for you, which one you're more comfortable with. But um, try to bear in mind that it's not going to be any one singular technique that is going to give you the most realistic result. Um, a lot of times you're going to need to mix and match these different techniques. Um, so, you know, you might want to do some hairspray with some paint chips, you know, painted on chips. Um, you might want to do some salt chipping with, say, you know, pencils. You might want to do, uh, you know, liquid mask and then back it up with sponge chipping. You're just, you know, you're going to be mixing it all in. And it's also going to depend on where on the, uh, the model the chipping is going to occur. That is going to also dictate what's the uh, best process that you want to use for that. Um, so there's going to be a follow-up to this video, um, kind of like a chipping part two, uh, where I'm going to look at where we can use some of these uh, chipping techniques to achieve other effects other than chipping. So like some paint degradation, some paint wear, uh, some uh, tonal variation, kind of similar to what I did when I uh, did the repaint on my uh, Bristol Bullfighter from Tamiya. Uh, so we're going to look at some of those kinds of effects and see how we can achieve that. So that brings it to the end of this particular video. Um, I, hope it, I hope you took something from it and I hope you found it very interesting. I know I certainly had a lot of fun doing it and We'll talk to you later. Thanks.